I'm going to teach tonight on living in victory, living in victory. See, I think victory, I love the spirit of your church. Can I tell you that? Y'all have got a great spirit. I hope you keep it up. And I think that the reason why you got a great spirit is because your preacher and his wife. You think that's true? Amen. Yes. Good. And I, I just enjoy this whole spirit of your church. Now, a lot of times the spirit of the church lies within the ladies. You know, that's what Brother Hiles taught us. He said that the woman was the Holy Spirit of the home and the Holy Spirit of the church. She helps set the spirit. So I'm going to give you some very practical points today on how to be a victorious Christian. Very practical. If you came, if you came and you never heard me speak and you're expecting some deep theological discussion, let me just tell you, it ain't going to come. Uh, I don't know how to be deep. I'm very shallow, but I try to be very practical in what I work on in my life. You know what I teach on is things that I'm working on in my own life. Because I figure what I got to work on, you might need some help with too. So I, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you for these great ladies. I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to do my best for you. I pray that uh, you would be glorified. Lord, that these points would help them to be better, that the homes would be improved because of these few things we're going to teach on. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Living in victory. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Now, I am 49 years old. You're supposed to act shocked. <gasps> well, last year, I started having to wear glasses to read. So now I type all my notes out and I make it in 14 points so I don't have to keep putting the glasses on and off. So I am reading from the Bible, King James Bible. It's just I don't have one up here. I always try to explain that so, so you don't think that I'm bad. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. For me, growing up in a, from a troubled environment, alcoholic dad, etc., etc., peace was a great commodity. So great that I even wrote a book called Possessing Peace. It's a six-week Bible study on how to have peace in your life. You know, peace is important to me. If any of you have ever lived in a troubled situation where you didn't know from one day to the next what was going to happen, you know, you didn't know if somebody's going to come in drunk, you didn't know if somebody was going to come in high, you didn't know, you know, it, you, it was just constant turmoil. If you ever lived in that kind of a situation, fighting, lots of fighting, you know, even those of us that didn't drink and cuss and chew and all that stuff, we fought a lot because we, so, we were so fed up with all the rest of them coming in on us. So peace was such a high con commodity for me in the early years that I wrote this thinking of how could I have peace in my family? How living in victory means having a peaceful life, you know, so I'm going to teach these four points on how to have peace in your home and how to live in victory. Okay. Now I, I told you I'm real simple minded. So point number one is keep your nose out of other people's business. You say, how does that have anything to do with peace and living in victory? Let me explain it to you. The Bible says in first Peter four 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief, or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Did you know the Bible teaches not to be a busybody? There's three different verses that use the word busybody. That means that I'm not supposed to be so helpful. Now, to me, when I stick my nose in other people's business, I'm being helpful. You know, like if I come in this church and I saw something was crooked and I come up to you and I started to tell you how to, this is that crooked and that's not in line. Would you want to know that? You know, and I, I'm just being helpful. Are you like that? I tell you what, I have an opinion about everything. You just asked me and I'd love to give it to you. You know, you asked me about your outfit. Is that my color? Oh, I'll tell you, no, it's not your color. You'd look better if you were wearing this color. You know, that's, I think I know everything. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible thing. I guess growing up strong made me this opinionated person, but the Bible says that if we'll keep our nose out of other people's business, we will live a more victorious life. We can be happier people. Illustration. You know, you always like illustrations, don't you? Well, I'm married to this wonderful man, and we drive around all the time in this big motorhome. You've seen it back there, haven't you? Have you ever tried to ride with somebody all the time? It's hard. Thousands of miles. We've covered hundreds of miles in the last couple weeks and it's really hard when he's driving not to try to help him see being helpful remember the next time you start to be helpful you're going to remember this I promise you because I've been speaking on this since January and every time I start to try to be helpful to somebody I think I don't think I'm supposed to be helpful that's being a busybody. but anyway uh so when we're driving my husband is a different driver than me 
You can understand that, can't you? How many of you, when you see that, the, uh, that a lane's going to end, it says right lane ends in half a mile? How many of you start getting over as soon as it says, you are, okay, now you're like me. That's the best to be. No, I'm kidding. Now, be honest. How many of you say, well, I don't always pay attention. Sometimes I like to wait till the last minute. And how many of you get over at the last minute? You can be honest. That's okay. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that says, thou shalt get over when as soon as you see the sign that says lane ends. There's no rule about that. Now, I'm so bad about this. I have such a strong opinion about it. When I'm in that big rig and I'm driving and I get over, I stay in the middle of the two lanes so that you can't go around me. And if I find a trucker that will help me, we both go along both things. We got it all worked out. I mean, we si signal each other. And we, I feel so powerful keeping people behind me, you know, because I don't like those of you that zip around me and then expect me to wait and let you in, you know. But so see, you can see I'm opinionated, can't you? Well, when I'm riding as the passenger and my husband's driving, it is all I can do to just sit there and not read the sign. Look, oh, look, the lane's going to end in half a mile. Because I, I don't want him, I don't like us to get bad signals from other people. Do you know what I mean by bad signals? You know, and here we got, we're ministry, you know, and supposed to be Christians, and we're doing, and I think, you know, people think we're rude. You know, I don't know. I just, sometimes we stick our nose in other people's business to try to, because of our pride, right? So, whenever Kevin is driving, my lip quivers sometimes because I want to tell him so badly to get over or be careful doing this or, ah, you know, or scream or whatever it is. So consequently, in order for me to not be a busybody, most of the time I have to sit there and look out the window this way. I've got it all figured out. See, some of you got to work this hard at not being a busybody. I think you're just like me. So I have to think, now, if I turn my head this way and look out the window on the side, it's hard to talk to him. If I talk to him while I'm looking out there, he hardly even hears me. So it's okay if I say, oh, look, the sign says we're gonna, that it's going to end in one half a mile. And, you know, and he says, what did you say? I said, oh, nothing. Because I come to myself then. But anyway, you know what? My home's a lot happier home when I stay in my own areas of responsibility. Some of you beg your husbands to discipline the kids. You beg them, please get involved with the children. I want somebody to be. And your, your husband comes home from work and he's just glad to see them and be able to kiss them once in a while. He don't want to have to beat them to death, you know, all the time. Uh, but so some of you want to get, you want your husband to be involved. But then when he starts being involved, you be a busybody. Now, let me just say this to you. In my situation, I have a girl and two boys, right? Do you know what is the hardest thing for me to do is shut my mouth when he's disciplining the boys? I don't know if you're like me or not, but I just think he doesn't know all the details of life that would affect his decision on how to discipline. So I want to help him. I want to give him all these opinions about, now, wait a minute, do you realize, when they were younger, do you realize that I didn't put them to bed and they didn't have their nap? That's a, our favorite excuse for misbehavior is they didn't have a nap. That, you know what? Most of the time your husband don't care whether they had a nap or not. They just want them to behave wham wham you know now I'm not talking about if they are if abusive you know if the, if you have a husband if you have a husband that's an abusive man that you need to go talk to your preacher about let him talk to you you know there are specific situations I'm talking about but what I'm saying is if your husband just finally gets involved and then all he hears from you is, but you don't understand and you don't know and what do you think about this and why and you start just giving him all these reasons why he shouldn't do what he's doing to him you're being protective and the worst part about it is you're being a busybody. And really, I, when I be a busybody, I really just think I'm being helpful. I walked in a church one time, and I looked. They, I went in there. I went and used their computer for something. And I saw a letter up there. Now, how many of you are secretarial-minded, right? Well, that letter, it didn't have the, it was a business letter, and it had the, date uh, it had the it had the return address the address you're sending it to him then it had the date then it had dear and the man's name and it was to a pastor that I knew that was a big known pastor it was all I could take it was all I could do to not point out to that person that they had did the letter incorrectly you know because I'm so helpful 
But you know what? I'm so proud of myself I didn't say anything because I know most of us don't want everybody to come around correcting us. You know, in church situations, have you, had, you got those helpful kind of people in your church? You know those kind? When you're setting up the church supper, they always know the best way to put the food out, right? You've been doing it a certain way. Somebody's in charge, and the preacher has allotted them as to be in charge of the church supper, and they want to put the plates first, then the meats, then the vegetables, or, you know, whatever order it's supposed to be, and maybe they have an idea of putting the drinks over separate, and you want to think it would be better to put the drinks at the end of the line. And do you, do you have people that are always trying to change things by giving their opinions. You know, they're being a busybody. When I'm not in charge of something, I'm just supposed to shut my little mouth. I'm telling you, though, it is the hardest thing in the world for me to do that. You teenage girls, when you're working with your mom on something, you get, you're at the age now where you think you know how to do some things. And can I tell you the truth? You do. In some situations, you're better at things than I, I know my kids. I've got two kids that are better at doing certain things than I am. And I don't like them to tell me how to do it because I know they, already, they do know how to do it better. Now, if I ask for their opinion, it's okay for them to say it to me, as long as they say it nicely and in a respectful way. But when they say, Mom, you're not doing it right, I just want to send them to the ceiling. <laughs> right? Because really, they're overstepping their boundaries, and I don't, want my, I don't want a boy or a girl overstepping their boundaries and getting out of order of what God has put them in. It's their order of, to be a follower. And while you're a follower, you don't tell people how to do things unless they ask you. You know, but, and then the, tell you, we're training, some, we're training our kids how to be busybodies by our examples on how to do it. Um, so construction, talk about church schedule. Uh, some of you have, I have an adult da daughter now. Now, when Jeannie got to be 17 years old, it was like a new thing for me to try to figure out now. You know, I, I'm not supposed to be telling her all the time how to do it. And aren't we, you moms, you want to tell these teenagers how to do everything because you're afraid they're going to do it wrong, and we don't want you to look stupid, right? It's, it's our pride. Well, my daughter drove me to a Walmart in Walls, Mississippi. And while we were in the Walmart, I had to go there. We were speak, I was speaking at a ladies' meeting. She drove me there. You know how neat it is to get to drive your mom around, et cetera, et cetera. So we pulled in. It was a super center. You know, the super center has food on one side and other things on the other side. Well, I was getting candy. And some super centers don't put the candy on the same side. So I went on the other side, thinking that's where the candy was. That's where she parked. So we walked in, and I went into and, and got my candy. Then we were cutting it a little close to get to the meeting. So I asked Jeannie, I said, Jeannie, would you mind pulling the car up and to get, so I can go in, so I can get the candy faster? So by this time, the, the candy was not on this other side. It was on the food side. So I was on the food side. We were parked on this side. I at, we were over here, and I asked Jeannie to go get the car and pull it up so I could get it. Now, most of the time, if you think it through, if somebody wants you to pull up closer, right, Miss Lori? You'd pull up at which door? The food side door, right? Well, probably Jeannie was just excited about driving me around, and she just thought, oh, I get to go get the car and pull it up. You know, she was just been driving for a little while. And I walk out of the food side, and I see Jeannie's pulled up over here. I'm not kidding, girls. I walked all the way over there thinking, now, Jeannie, if I want you to be fast, it seems like the fastest thing would have been pulled up at the door where you know I was, the door you came out of. You know, and I'm walking over there thinking, now, do I tell her? You know, because if I tell her, that will help her to know for next time. Isn't that how we are? I want you to learn from this. And the best way for you to learn from me is just directly tell you how stupid you are. <laughs> well, I walked over there, and I got in the car, and I said, okay, then we're here. Let's go. Thanks for pulling up the car. And I didn't say a word. Now, that's the first time. <laughs> I'm bragging like I do it all the time, but I'm just telling you I don't do it all the time. The reason I'm speaking on it is because I'm working on not, not trying to go on all the time. See, we, we nag at our kids and teach them. We call it teaching. But really, we're sticking our nose where it doesn't belong. Now, look, there comes a point with your teenagers, adult children, where you just need to back off and let them learn from their own mistakes. You know, you'll have a greater relationship with each other. If you don't have a close relationship with your daughter right now, a teenage daughter, it's because she gets sick of you telling her what to do. And then teenagers, 
it's maybe because you don't obey what you're supposed to obey. And you have an, you have an attitude. I don't even like using the attitude thing. Oh, you got an attitude. What, what kind of attitude? You know, what, what's the word mean? You know, and that, it's such a, uh, it can be such a thing that makes prickly feelings inside each other. And that does not make peace and victory in your home. So working on relationships means if you set boundaries on what you're going to correct them on, you know, that will help you in your relationship with each other. Okay, so the point number one is keep your nose out of the people's business. Point number two is give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, Jesus is our supreme example of this. Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. See, Jesus said, Father, they are crucifying me. They put me on this cross, but they don't really understand that you planned this. And this is for good. And this is going to help us. So what this says to me is, if I'm supposed to give pe people the benefit of the doubt, that I don't judge why. Do you know I analyze everything? It's not what you do, it's why you do it. I try to figure out, now, if you came up and talked to me about that, are you trying to give me a secret message like I'm supposed to not be at that meeting? Or, you know, I, I always try to think of the why. Has your husband ever said anything to you? And you say, now, you just saying that because, and you give him this long spiel of why, and he's thinking, I didn't even think that th far through it. You know, he's just in the box right now where he's saying something to you. So give people the benefit of the doubt. I was in a laundromat in February in Florida. And you see how we dress? We got these boots, you know. I, we were in a restaurant today, Miss Lori, and I noticed people staring at us. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, it's pe they're not used to seeing people dress like this. You know, I don't even think about it because I'm so used to dressing like The last two or three years, I've pretty much just dressed all the time like this. So I go to the laundromat once a week, and in Florida, in the laundromat, I'm sure they're not used to people walking in with cowboy boots on, you know, and got this big personality. And so I'm, and my mother-in-law and father-in-law were with me. And uh, we went in there, and we were going to get it done. I like to get my laundry done in an hour and a half. You know, oh, man, zip it through it, you know, get it done, get it done. And you can tell I can do everything fast, can't you? So I got into the laundromat, and was, we were zipping around, my father-in-law, mother-in-law, and there was a small laundromat, and there was a man in there doing his laundry. I hate to see men in laundromats doing their laundry. You know why? Because they put their jeans in with their underwear. Go back to point number one. I want to go up and tell them, look, sir, you don't put jeans and underwear together. It looks, makes them turn blue. You know, I want to help them. Most of the time in the laundromats, when men come do their own laundry, it's, there's a reason. They're alone. You know what I mean? And, mm. So anyway, so there was a man, only a man in there, and we had gotten all our clothes done in, in the dryers, and we were starting to pull them out of the dryers. There were three carts in the whole store, and we didn't realize that there were only three carts in the store. So I had a cart. My father-in-law had a cart. My mother-in-law had a cart. Right? And so we're all zipping around and we each are folding stuff as fast as we can. All of a sudden, that man walked up to me and he said, Could you get me one of those carts? And I said, Yes. And I picked up every bit of clothes I could get and threw it somewhere and just pushed the cart to There, go. I'm so sorry. You know, and I just started talking like that. You know, my, you know that man, he thought I was a cart hog. I bet he just said, Oh, she thinks she's some fancy. A lot of people think I'm a country music singer because I dress like this. You, you shook your head. Did you think that? I mean, I, I get on the plane sometimes. Now, forgive me. I don't mean to be lying, but people come up to me and they say, are you a country music singer? I say, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to explain. You know, no, I'm from Indiana. Originally, I'm from West Virginia. And not, now I'm really from Indiana, and I'm not from Texas. And I'm not from, you know, I don't want to give all this list of where I'm not from, you know. And then they say, they sort of look at you like, well, why are you dressing like that? It's like that you're trying to get all this attention. So, the easiest thing for me to do is just go light with them. Yeah, I'm a country music singer. And they ask me any more questions, and I just say, oh, I just sing every week, everywhere. Somewhere is different, you know. I doubt if you know me because I just do local area places. You know, I just talk like that. But you know what I'm saying? He probably thought, oh, she's some fancy lady, thinks she's so hot stuff, you know, and go in here. And he thought, I was a card hog. Can I tell you, I, I'm innocent. I did not mean to be a card hog. It was completely by mistake that I had all those carts. Right? But he just thought I was. You know what? That's the truth about the people around you, too. Are you thinking of somebody in the church that's got a little bit of a snippy personality? You know, bites at people? You know, something like that? Do you know they don't really? Let's, let's go like Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they just had a bad day. Maybe they've just had a bad day every day of their life. <laughs> you know? Maybe they're used to being 
uh, grouchy. Maybe they're used to just being, uh, I have been around certain types of people that they just thrive on telling you the opinion. I have a relative that when I make soup, that relative always makes a me what's wrong with the soup. You, you got a relative like that? Amen. You're laughing. I know you understand. Now, you know what I want to say? I just want to say that relative's putting me down just to make me feel stupid. That's what my, my inside wants to think. But you know what? If I'm going to practice this point number two of giving people benefit of the doubt, I'm just going to say, oh, she's just being helpful. You know, and she just thought, I want to know. And I do want to know how to make soup better. You know, have you ever made potato soup and it looks like potato salad? <laughs> you know, you put too much cornstarch in it. Or do you thicken yours, cream soups? Yeah. So anyways, things like that. You know what I'm saying. But just instead of you getting upset with people, I'm saying give them the benefit of the doubt. Do you, let me say something to you in defense of your preacher. We ladies always want to figure out why the preacher's doing things. You know, going back to that analysis thing. But you know what? If we would just give him the benefit of the doubt that everything he's doing is for the best of this church. Take, for instance, he might choose somebody to be, uh, another lady to be in charge of something, and you don't think she's worthy of being in charge of that. Could you give him the benefit of the doubt that he knows the total picture? And go back to point one, number one, where we say just keep your nose out of everybody's business. And can I say this? Just go with it because that's what the preacher wants. You know, if we are that kind of Christians, we will live in victory. I want a victorious life. I want a peaceful life. I want to be a happy person. You see me bouncing down the aisles and acting happy all the time. That's because I practice these two points. Point number three. Point number three is don't give attention to negative. Don't give attention to negative. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. As I'm working for God and doing his will, I have got to learn how to get, not give attention to negative. What is, an, what is a negative? A negative is something that I don't think is good. Now, I'm looking around the room, and I don't think this applies to anybody, but can I say this to you? When we point out things about people, you know, that's, that's a negative fact about them. I sometimes do it because I think I'm funny. You know, like sitting in airports and I say, oh, look at that funny looking man. Well, how he's walking, you know, <gasps> or look at that man in his pajamas. I just think that's so funny when people are walking around in their pajamas. You, are you with me on that? You know, I just think that's stupid. I think, man, you know, my mom would have beat me if I'd have went out in my pajamas. Now it seems like it, and they even ride on airplanes in their pajamas. And I think, ooh. but by me pointing it out, though, I'm training my mind to, uh, to give attention to negative, you know, like. What I mean by, I, I learned this from Mrs. Evans. I used to travel with her for 11 years as a mini spectacular coordinator and went to a lot of meetings with her. And she just hardly noticed negative things happening around her. You know, like it's easy for me to speak to you and not pay attention to the babies because I'm so into you. It's what I choose to give attention to, right? So don't give attention to negative. I had a real test of it in March of this year. I was in a, a motel at a ladies' meeting in Washington State, and I was downstairs at the, you know, the breakfast buffet, and there was two ladies. I was sitting eating with two ladies. I looked up on the television, and usually on television, aren't they pretty good-looking people on television? I looked up, and there was the ugliest man I'd ever seen in my entire life on the television screen talking. He had fuzzy black hair, he had a black mustache, he had black horn room glasses, and he was talking something like, you know, I couldn't hear what he's saying, but I could see his mouth was moving funny. Now, normally, before I started working on this, I would have looked, pointed at those ladies and said, ladies, have you ever seen an uglier man than that? I would have. Isn't that awful? Can I tell you another thing I think is a little bit of a negative in most, uh, most Baptist churches? is you women that wear low-cut tops. Now, don't get mad at me about this. I don't know if it's jealousy because I have nothing up here. You know, but my eye goes to that. When I see somebody with low-cut top on, you know, I, I don't, I, you know the words cleavage. You know that, don't you? I don't have cleavage. You know, there's nothing there. A lot of space, you know? <laughs> 
Now, those of you that are big busted, you don't understand this, you know. So when I'm in a church and we're singing and somebody's out there and they got low cut on, I just can't believe, you know, I said, wow, look at that, you know. <laughs> now, I am not even weird. I mean, I'm married, got three kids. I love my husband. I have never been attracted to women in my life. But my eye, it's a negative to me when I see somebody. And it, this is, maybe it's because I'm so opinionated about, or maybe I'm jealous. I don't know what it is. But anyway, low cut tops is really one of those things I could do without the rest of my life, you know. Uh, so we got, but I, really, I need to train myself not to, it's really hard though when you, when they got it and I want to talk to them. I'm supposed to be looking at their eyes, not looking down there, you know, I, no examination, Loretta. No, no, no. So negative, don't give attention to negatives. When you commit your works unto the Lord, your thoughts shall be established. And what that means is that I'm supposed to train my mind to divert away from negative situations. That means if you are in, you, if, like if in a church and you're hearing somebody talk bad, well, you just go away from them and don't even pay attention to them. You don't go to another person. I over, do you know what I overheard? I overheard Susie saying that, I don't know, it, 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 how many times have we went to somebody else and spread bad news, a negative? That stirs up trouble in your church. That takes away your victorious, your victorious life. Do you know why some of you are so negative? Because you watch negative on television. I don't even watch the news most of the time. Makes me nervous when I see all these people getting raped and getting, you know, kids stolen from their, you know, I think, wow, you know, that's, you don't have any control over the negative that comes in. Now, on the Internet, sometimes on my, I'll, I'll read news stories because I can choose what I want to read. But, man, sometimes we get so overwhelmed, overcome with evil and negative that it affects our spirit. Uh, point number four, don't give attention to negative. Point number four is make a plan for times of worry. Now, let me just tell you this. I like to worry. It's my hobby. You know, I like to worry about lots of things. I like to worry about money. Yes, you with me? I like to worry about my weight. Are you with me on that? You say, oh, you don't have any problem with your weight. Oh, brother. Everybody has problems with their weight, especially if they're 49 years old. <laughs> you know, about f four years ago, I had an expansion program that I didn't plan on. I gained 20 pounds. And do you think I can get that 20 pounds off? No. But you know what's so good about my body type? It's all from here below. And you know what skirts do? They hide it. No else, nothing else. I'm glad I wear skirts because of that. If I have pants on, you go, whoa, look at that. Oh, boom, boom, doo -doo. it's bad. It'd be bad. So, so from here down, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a lovely sight, you know. But I've changed, I don't know, I've changed skirt sizes, is what I'm saying, you know, and it's bad. Now, one of the good things about being in evangelism, you know, you, won't, you can wear the same skirt every Sunday and nobody ever know it. <laughs> yeah, I love that part. I always look on the positive side of all my things in my life, you know. But uh, make a plan for times of worry. Some of us, you get up on Sunday morning. It happened this morning. You know it did. You went to your closet. And you're like me. What am I going to wear today? You pull out something. You try it on. If you're a good Christian like I try to be, you look in the mirror and you say, oops, a little too snug there. Got to, lose that other, that, got to lose that little bit of chunky. So you take that one off, and then you go get another one. You, take, you take, put that one on, and it's, your fa it's always your favorite outfits, right? Because your favorite outfits you've worn over and over, and the, as you've worn them, you know, they used to be size large. Now they've shrunk down to mediums. That's my excuse, at least. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've worn them so much that they're shrunk now from washing them. But anyway, so you keep trying them on, trying them on, and you get frustrated. And you get bothered by your size. You get bothered by the fact none of your clothes fit you. And you know, you know what you do? Then your kid comes in and says, Mom, can I have some syrup? Oh, go fix whatever you want. I don't care what you go. Just go get something out of the kitchen. <laughs> now, you know you're not really upset with that kid. And you want to take care of them, and you want them to have some food. It's just you're bothered and worried about your weight right now. You know, Sunday morning is a good time. It's a perfect time for most of us women to worry about our clothes and about our weight. Now, I'm, I'm being serious when I say this. As far as my weight's concerned, 
I'm still trying to watch it. I'm watching it grow. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm still trying to watch it. I don't want to keep adding weight to myself. But if this is the weight I'm going to be the rest of my life, I'm going to buy clothes that look good on me. You know, like since I'm big here, you know, read books. I've read lots of books, girls. If you don't have, most of us, you know, the Barbie dolls, we don't have that kind of a figure. Ah, that's only on television. You know, there's something disportioned about us. You know, got a big nose, something, I don't know. But uh, there's a way to find out how you can look your best for whatever size you are. I know lots of women that are size 20s that they look really good because they've learned what types of clothes look best on them. You don't get favorite styles for yourself. You find out what looks best on you. You know, like I, you, you know why I look good with this? Because it adds some shoulders because my shoulders are smaller than my hips. You know, I don't wear sweaters that go, fall down, you know, without any shape to them. I, I wear sweaters that have some kind of padding in them. So who look like a football player? <laughs> no, but you know, you understand what I'm saying? Now, and that helps me not worry about my clothes. Another thing I do to not worry about my size is I've got small, medium, and large organization in my closet. And this past summer, I got rid of all the smalls. I said, I'll never get back down there. I'm not going to keep it and torment myself to death. I did keep the mediums. Now I'm in the larges. So now I have mediums and larges. And you know what? Until I know I've lost weight, I'm not even going to try on those mediums. Some of you torment yourself every week. Oh, I hope I got down to the size I can wear that outfit. And you try it on and, no, it's still too tight. Ah, so then you get mean. Hagatha comes out again. Ah. But, play, you know the best time to worry about your weight? Monday morning. That's the best time to try the uh, diet of the week. You know? If you're going to worry, worry about it sometime. Plan when you're going to worry. A lot of times, we, we, even, we go to bed worrying about money. And it keeps, it takes us from our sleep. It takes sleep away from us. And then we wake up feeling like we never went to sleep at all. And you probably didn't because you were went to bed worrying about something. That's not the time to worry. You know, there's a time for all that. Lamentations 3, 25 through 26. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. So if we make plans for a time of worry. If we uh, don't give attention to negative, if we give people the benefit of the doubt, if we keep our nose out of other people's business, you know, our lives would be so much better. We'd have peaceful, victorious lives. I didn't think I'd have enough time to tell you this illustration, but I want to go back to give people the benefit of the doubt. Some of you have a child that, you're, he's in, that he or she's in her upper years, and you're worried about that child for some reason or another. And what... When we worry about a child, what it ends up happening is we nag them. Pick up this. Do that. Make sure of this. You know, you, you just nag them about everything because you're worried about their character. Right? Give them the benefit of the doubt that God loves them as much as you do. And God wants that child to turn out. Let me explain what happened to me last November. Last, not, not this past year, but the year before, I was very worried about one of my children. I, I was worried that that child was too talented. I was worried about that child having enough character to get that child through. You know, you just get worried. So as I was worried, I, I noticed I kept picking on, you know, if that kid would just leave something out. I, oh, well, look over here. What do you got over here? And, you know, I wasn't kind about it either because I was so worried about it, you know. So I noticed I was being a little bit on that kid all the time. And I knew that that's not healthy. It does not enhance my relationship with the child. It does not help him. I think I was what I, the Bible used the word provoke, and I think I was provoking him to anger. So in November, I said, Lord, I'm awful worried about this kid. I said, would you please show me that he's going to be okay or she's going to be okay? Would you please show me that? I, I said, Lord, would you do that? And so I prayed all November. I prayed all December. I prayed all January. I kept praying because God didn't show me. I knew God would show me in a specific way, and I'd have peace to know that God was going to take care of it. In February, we went, to a, uh, we went to a camp meeting, and I had to drive to pick up somebody at the airport. And while I was driving picking somebody at the airport, I had two of the kids with me. And then one of the kids went with Kevin straight in the motorhome to that meeting. When I finally got that person, you know how airports, you're all, everything's, all the flights are always delayed. I finally got there. 
I walked into the motorhome. When I walked in, I noticed something was different about that motorhome. And I said, what's, what's different in here? And that kid looked at me and just smiled. And when that kid smiles, I worry that something's going on. You know, I <laughs> think, oh, no, what's that kid done now, you know? Like, and th that kid smiled, and I said, did, did you clean this motorhome? And that kid said, cleaned it. I mean, really like, dusted it, cleaned the mirrors. I mean, cleaned it. Didn't just do the middle of the vacuum and in the middle of the floor. You know what I mean? I sat down on, the, on my chair in the front of the motorhome, and I, I, I'd have passed out if I, I didn't want to, I didn't think it'd be a good thing for that kid to see me being so shocked, you know. But I sat down, and I just thanked and thanked and thanked the kid, and I said, oh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much for doing it. You know, and I went on and on to the kid, but in my heart, I said, God, thank you. I know you love this kid, and I know this kid's going to be okay. You know, I have to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's going to be okay. And I've got to trust God to make up whatever I can't give that kid. I've got to trust God to bring things in his life or in her life to make it happen so that that child will be all that God wants him to be. You know, we're, we, these kids are only on loan to us. Those of you that have kids, I hope it's giving you a little peace to say, you know, I'm not in this alone raising these kids. I heard you got some big families around here. I think that'd be extremely hard to feel like you're doing a good job with all of the individual kids. But you know what? God, partner with God and make a plan for a time of worry about that child and really make it a matter of prayer and let God show you that kid's going to be okay. That's our word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you for these ladies. I pray you'll bless them. I pray, Lord, that because of this little short session, that some of them would learn something about sticking their nose in other people's business. I pray, Lord, some of them would get a, not give attention to negative. I pray some of them would stop worrying all the time and make just sit down and have a plan time for worry. I pray, Lord, that some of them would give other people, cut, cut them some slack, give them some benefit of the doubt so that they'd be happier people. Lord, help us not be so judgmental. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, who says, Loretta, God spoke to my heart, and I can think of one specific thing that I need to change in my life as a result of hearing these four points. And if